Cool. Um, nice. Mr. or Miss Wonton Parmesan. Uh, let me think. So, hmm. So hands are tricky because if you get the, you know, like this, you have some beautiful shapes going on here on this hand. Yeah. You know, the, the shape design, the, the echo, the ripple of, of the, the repetition of these shapes, it works really well. Even the silhouette and the negative space kind of just reads as a hand and all that. However, as we go towards the other hands, I think things feel a little bit more complex and complicated and um, a bit out of place uh, in terms of proportion and, and stuff. So, hmm, I think, I think one thing you have to look for is relationship between shapes and, and landmarks. For example, you have, like we mentioned with the different locations of the knuckles like that's that's a huge one but if you notice where that is in relationship to uh these upper knuckles it they're pretty distant right but if we look over here they're kind of a stranger mix where this one's up here then that one's over here then these two are next to each other which you know that's that's correct here but i think this one overall should be lower um and in Antonio's first crit, he kind of talked about showing form. And I think it's going to be a mix of the proportion and position, but also form. So imagine each finger as a cylinder or a sausage or something easy to remember. So if you kind of just see this as a cylinder, and you can put a little sphere there for a joint, another sphere there, and another cylinder like this. And a final one down here. Now, if we take those out <clears throat> and separate them, you can, as he also showed, uh, vary the distances and uh, proportions of them. So, and it's kind of what you were doing here, but if you can do them like this with form, you'll be better off. For example, if we just draw one big cylinder, easy, no problem. Okay. And then if you want to do like kind of a stubby, uh, you know, kind of, Sasquatch kind of hand you could even shorten that for proportion and then take that next cylinder and I'm bowing it out a little bit or like a little bell uh, towards the ends here because that's where the knuckle is right and so I can bring that sphere out a little bit for some style and then make sure that little sausage is there as well a little cylinder and just by drawing the form like that and the knuckle you can take that and bring it over. Oh, well, let's merge that down first. Bring it over here, and suddenly it just has a lot more presence, and and um, I guess making more of a statement of, hey, this is a hand, right? And so if we look at that um, constellation of what's happening here, we know that the next knuckle of the middle finger is down below more than a forty-five degree angle. Angle, uh, but we could just say that's pretty much what you already have here, and then you can connect them with big. Big old sausages. Why am I using the airbrush SMH? And something interesting you point out there as well, um, Matt, is that um, most people tend to understand like, you know, that fingers or cylinders, you know, connected to spheres. But then when they need to go and redesign like this, what, whatever, you know, kind of creature hand this is, they kind of tend yeah. to forget those simple shapes instead of playing yeah. with those simple shapes and manipulating them to be or to fit that design aesthetic, right? Like you're doing right now. Play with the proportions of the sphere, play with the proportions of the of the cylinder, and you have that, you know, the design that you need. Exactly. And I think one way to help drive that home, honestly, it, it might be like a left field kind of thing, but I'd say learning to sculpt because you have to think in form through some cheap clay or ZBrush, you kind of like go through the methods of placing these objects, the spheres, the cylinders, and then putting them next to each other to find an aesthetic that looks good. Um, and so, you know, what, you know, furthermore, if we look at the thumb here, sure, we could say that looks like a thumb, but what if we really want to drive that home? If we were to sculpt this and get it 3D printed, we want to get it right. So if we look at the thumb over here, uh, I want you to think of sort of like landscape where, you know, forget that it's a thumb. Let's just crop this. Let's put some sun, some clouds. 
This is a, a pretty prominent peak. You can even put a little house up there. It's a very important and necessary uh, part of the design. And there's a, a thing over here with a cliff. You can add some water there. And then the, the hill goes up a little bit slightly. But that peak, we can call it uh, Thumb Peak, is really important. So that's being caused by the joint there pushing that. And then we could put the little sausage here and the other there. And I don't even have to look at the reference. I could just go over here and say, all right, well, we went to this location and there was this little house there on top of this peak. Cool. We know that. Super easy. Barely an inconvenience. And then... Uh, from there, you draw the little sausage for, let's move it down a little bit, uh, the form of the thumb, and that peak is there, and then the, the hill kind of uh, tapers off downward like that, right? And then that automatically gives you the proper silhouette to emphasize that peak. And that's obviously just from this angle, but it's the same thing you can apply in terms of looking for those apex uh, vertices on everything that you're drawing, including this part of the hand and this little valley there. Uh, and, and the more you do this carefully and slowly, the more it's embedded into your second nature. And uh, you're going to say something? No, no. Oh, yeah, I thought I heard something. Right. So uh, understand the forms, exaggerate them, push and pull them, but make sure that the relationships between each other are there. Uh, and over here, um, I'd say there's a couple of things that are a bit off. Uh, it's, it's definitely a good start, but try to remember, again, the, these very specific landmarks. And if you think of the thumb area, let's just draw that from the top down, facing normal. If here's like the palm area, you draw just an octagon stop sign. So you, you start one, two, three, and if you finished it, you'd, be, you'd have like an octagon, right? But if we just erase all that, that kind of gives us the shape of the thumb. And this point is super important to help kind of indicate that it's a thumb. Whereas we lose it over here. We have the first uh, polygon, this one, but then we miss this one. So uh, what I would do is just put another point there and connect it, right? So uh, be sure to remember every part that makes the thumb. Uh, having said that, I think visually you could do this to, to look a little bit more interesting, and I'll just do a quick study of how I would do it. And I won't take too long on this. I actually like to draw hands with this brush. But I like to find interlocking shapes. So we have this thumb area, and then this here, which has some really nice, easy-to-read forms. And then it, it kind of splays out from an origin. And that visual, I guess, um, hmm, language is really appealing. So what I would do is probably start with that first little bump, go up, overlap. We got, you know, this area now, and we have this sudden turn. So I'm going to actually emphasize that and push it down even further and let that little thumbnail really push out into the silhouette, overlap here, here as well, and then kind of continue on that way. And then I'm going to remember, well, this is just a big form. This it's very easy to read, so you might as well just lay that line in there. Maybe put a couple indications of, of that form uh, and then work my way out. Uh, you, you might see often like the constructions of like, oh, well, you do it lightly first and do all that. That works too. Uh, I just kind of enjoy finding these peaks and valleys and treating them as sort of uh, stop signs. Or not stop signs. Well, yeah, stop signs, but also landmarks to move from. Now, over here, we have a little dip and then outward here for... Um, that part of the palm. So we're just going to dip in, go out, get that nice uh, form in there. And then uh, this shape is pretty much like a, a square, but then it goes in for the pinky. So you can kind of just make sure it's in the right spot. So it's past this thumbnail area. And you have to start with the square and then go in for that pinky. And here's the fun part for me, where if you look at the reference, you have a very specific constellation of where these are. What I'm going to do is make this one bigger and push it out further. Not that much, but I'm going to be playing with this stuff so we have a more interesting variation uh, as a sort of dance of, of taking these elements and kind of playing with them. So over here, I'll probably not even do this stuff yet and just do the star of the show. And for me, that's the fingertips. And the first one being this right there, and it's pointing to that part of the thumb. So I can kind of just uh, map out exactly where that is. And then we got one, 
And then the next one is going to be somewhere over here. And then the next one, I know it and to be accurate, it's probably going to be right there. But I, again, I want to push it. So I'm going to go further out, make it a little bit bigger. And then the next one uh, closer in. So now we have a nice, um, instead of it being a straight connected line like that, for the sake of style, I want it to go here, dip in and then out. So it's not a straight line down here anymore. And then, you know, I could start connecting stuff and um, making sense of it if I was to kind of take my time and figure out all that. But now uh, we're going in into the territory of uh, stylistic choices and design. And, you know, for werewolves and other, you know, otherworldly creatures, this is kind of my approach. I probably went too far with that. I bring it in a little bit like this. Um, but also notice that they're all pointing roughly. Uh, well, this one's going upward, but uh, the 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 fingertips aren't pointing in the same way, but the the beginnings of the fingers are all coming from the same origin. Anyway, that was a bit more of an in-depth uh, explanation, but that would be my uh, two takes on these different sketches. Yeah, really cool. This almost turned into a workshop, guys. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, cool. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah. let's see. Now we have sure what the entire, but I think it's Abdullah Tif or Abdul Atif. Um, the Latif, yeah, the no. servant of Latif. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, nice to know. Um, <laughs> really, I mean, the design, I, I really like your design thinking. Um, Abdul or Abdullah, I'm not sure. Um, there's some I really good Abdul, shape language. Yeah. Is it Abdul or Abdullah? I think it's Abdul. Yeah. Abdul, okay. Uh, we're going to go with Abdul. So there's some really <laughs> cool shape language gonna, going on here. Um, I like how you are, for instance, for this sort of gorilla hand, you are using more rounded shapes to communicate like the thickness um, compared to like this scaly type of hand. You're using more of the shape language, of, like you know, sharper triangular shape language, which I really like, which is communicating well in the design. Um, I feel like... The thing that's lacking still a little bit is just some anatomical understanding and structural understanding first and foremost compared to design understanding. Um, and like a lot of that has been discussed in the feedback here already. Um, you know, just adding more structure to your overall simple shapes instead of you know simply outlining them or not overlapping them. Um, or for instance, with something like this, something that we tend to see quite a bit with um, fingers that you know you look almost straight up at, um, is that we get this Michelin effect, right, where you do the bump after bump after bump, and also like almost the same size, um, which really creates like a very bumpy effect uh, and to kind of mitigate that one thing you should know is that when we have the anatomy of the fingers right like i said um with the bones like so they protrude out and they kind of you know they're saddle joints so they kind of connect together like this so actually compared to what you have for your fingers it's the exact opposite that is actually happening so instead of where you have this these folds that you can see in the on the inside of your fingers right which you indicated correctly but on those folds we actually are meeting these uh, finger bones right so it actually protrudes outwards even if you were to um you know over exaggerate like the size of it right it would come out on these ends, right? And this is where you would see those folds. Now, also what we sometimes tend to do or what I, you know, what I often see with people that stylize hands and, and um, you know, just designers in general is that 
we kind of cheated a little bit um, as to when you see the inside of the hand, we don't really necessarily draw it straight on, straight on as if it were like an orthographic view or a profile view because it usually tends to flatten the finger out. So um, what, what we see a lot is that we draw a meaty part of the, the hand or the finger, sorry, right? And then we draw that bony part on the other side. Even if it's subtle, right? We still, like, and if I were to exaggerate it, sometimes, you know. We tend to play a little bit with shape language on, on, on each side or exaggeration of form to create a little bit more of the feeling that we at least are looking at a finger that has some bony indication and not only like this meaty part that creates like a Michelin feeling, right? Um, and so the same thing for like this finger that you have bending, again, you can use that sort of exaggeration of, because usually as designers, what we're trying to do is we're trying to state the obvious or exaggerate the obvious. And so we do the same with either finger or the hand in general. And so this, this um, finger that you have that's bent here, we want to exaggerate the top part as you know, indicating that it's very bony and we can even use a little bit of overlap to show depth, right? And then we could use a curve and then we exaggerate that meaty part and especially in this guy because it's like he has thick fingers right and so we think about like med said and like i did in the beginning we think about those simple shapes that sphere right that's wrapping around that contour we can again exaggerate that sphere because you know or cylinder sorry we can exaggerate that and exaggerate the boniness of that finger here to create a little bit more structure, believability, and also just design into that finger, right? And you can even give it some hair if you wanted to, right? Uh, play with that. But that's something that I would say would help you with the rest of your designs as well. Just looking at, or looking for an excuse to overstate the obvious, like where's the bony part of my finger, um, where's the meaty part, exaggerate that, and also play with those simple shapes in order to, to really you know, drive home that statement of what you're trying to sell. No, yeah, I agree with everything you just said, it's perfect. All right. Yeah. Then let's move on to some painting because we've done a lot of drawing now. Um, Ooh, paintings, a okay. Of painting ones, so. This one, Med, is for you. Take it away. For sure. One moment. And who might have done this one? Go on. Reveal yourself. Seeker of Truth. No, sorry. Rolly. Seeker of Truth is next. Rolly. R O L I. Rolly. I love Rolly. Chat. Chat. So you can crush him. All right. You better be ready, buddy. Okay. Today. Yeah, you're done. Uh, cool. Yeah. So, um, good. I'm. Uh, let me process this for a moment. So, in terms of, <laughs> may the odds be ever in your favor. So, in terms of, um, why do I hear boss music? I gotta stop looking at chat. This is not a stream. <laughs> Back to shop. Uh. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of uh, stylization, you know, well, the, well, the drawing of the hand is there, and I think it could still use a lot of the stuff we talked about in terms of, um, you know, those, those specific peaks. You got, yeah. you know, the knuckle here, close here, and uh, all that stuff. But what I'd want you to do to really, really get this um, is go back to that reference and grab the photo, and I'll just show you second on this photo dun, 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 dun. sorry it's gonna uh so go back to that photo and try to 
do a low poly geometry wireframe over the specifics of what's actually facing upward and what's to the side and do this for like I don't know, 10, 20, 30 images so that you become really familiar with the forms here. I think overall painting, um, you know, faces, hands, whatever. It, the, the hardest thing that people are missing out on, or not the hardest, but the most common thing is understanding the form. And that's what this will help you do. Because as I look at this, uh, I can tell that the forms are sort of there, but the, the values and the colors are kind of not following the form. Uh, they're starting to. It certainly does feel like, you know, we have a shadow side. Good job. That works. And it kind of gradates outward towards the light side. Great. But uh, let me just paint over and, and explain what I would do. Um, actually, before I even do that, if I have a, a cylinder, okay, we have light source coming from here. Go ahead and make a new layer underneath it. Let's fill that in with that skin tone color, no problem. And we can go halfway to black for the shadow, change the hue a little bit to maintain a bit of color um, joy, if you will. I put that in the shadow side, and then we can blend it with the airbrush, mixer brush, smudge brush, whatever you want to do, right? Now, the thing is, uh, we need the, the highlight. Cool, let's steal your color. Do you already have it here? But the, the thing is, and the reason why I don't think uh, I'm done here, with this is because it kind of goes from dark to midtone to highlight. But uh, in reality, what usually happens for a cylinder, especially, is it, it will roll back to uh, midtone or shadow. So I'm, I'm, we're missing that, that value here that helps isolate that beautiful highlight, right? So uh, we call that rolling over of the form. If we kind of just do something like that, just by doing that, it has far more appeal and it's more interesting to look at. And of course, we can steal some of your bounce light, uh, just put that in there as well. But automatically, it, it, it's showing so much more dimension. So if we apply that to here, what I'd love to see is let me grab my brushes, is a, a stronger indication of the forms here. So the core shadow kind of doing something like that. I don't have the reference, so I'm kind of just winging it but also a, a, a kind of uh, going back to the midtone here and letting that, um, that highlight be more isolated. And I'll show you what that'll look like in a moment here on the hand and how much more effective that'll be uh, for indication of form. Someone who I'd highly recommend studying for something like this is J.C. Liondecker. And just by doing that, look how it just, it, it feels 3D, it, it's standing out, and, and it has like a nice kind of implication of um, three-dimensionality. And you can even use this to your advantage for things like foreshortening, right? So once we have that, then we can kind of get in there and blend it, not be so obvious with all that stuff. So now we can kind of paint in like this. And, and like magic, it's like, oh, wow, for some reason it reads, uh, you know, more, more effectively than, than not using that method. So let's take it away for a second. And kind of just look at the difference, right? So uh, do more of that, understand rendering forms. And if you have a hard time with rendering forms at the basic level, I would say draw a bunch of cylinders, draw a bunch of boxes and shade them like this uh, to become familiar with what feels right in terms of highlight value and shadow. And so I would even go and add some stuff like that. So it's not all the same value all the way across, but this is what's missing, I believe. And once you, um, learn how to do this, I would start with the pinky and then overlap with everything coming forward. Because let's say I already did that. I'd probably render this area and then do the thumb. Let's do that real quick. So that it's um, standing out against everything else. I'm just gonna pull from my mental library of the many times I've painted hands. Oh, okay, so there's going to be a little bump here for that little part of the knuckle of the thumb. And then uh, the thumbnail goes there. And we can grab that airbrush to kind of render things out a little bit. Let's go ahead and flatten it, use the mixer brush. But now, now it feels nice in 3D because we're rolling over the form right here. 
but also it's overlapping the other thing that we rendered earlier. It's going to cut in there a little bit, right? Um, granted, that would be much easier with reference, but uh, that's kind of what I'm looking for when I'm trying to convey form effectively. It's going to be uh, treating it like a primitive shape, but morphed into, well, in this case, a thumb and fingers. That's pretty much all I'd say for that. Awesome. Uh, yeah, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Otherwise, good job. Wholeheartedly agree. Show. All right. Um, let's take a square brush for a second. No, just keep it around. All right. So we have Seeker of Truth next. Um. So basically, what Ahmed has been saying, um, Seeker is exactly what you should apply here because that's the first thing that I saw as well is that your highlight is like the one that flattens out the image, right? So just like what Ahmed just said, it like we have shadow, a shadow shape, right? And then we have half tones and then we have the highlights, but there's nothing in this round form that's indicating the rolling of that form by re-establishing a half tone on the other side, right? So that's the first thing as well that I would introduce here, just to already give it a lot more volume. Um, and the second thing that's a little bit, I think, misleading about the reference that you used is that in this reference from, I'm, I'm not sure who the artist is, that's a very good artist from what I can see. But the thing is like the way he or she separated the lights from the darks is one graphic, but it's also to indicate the separation between like hard edges almost, right? So we have an instant plane change. So that means that we also create like an instant shadow and there's not many half tones to, to you know, to exist here because they do not need to show any rolling of form, right? And the same goes for the space between the fingers. Those are cast shadows, right? And so they, ha they these are very harsh, abrupt shadows, but within those, they, there's only half tones and highlights. But the thing with yours is that you're almost indicating the same abrupt shad shadow change or plane change but you're doing it for something that is actually very round and soft, right? Even you know, you, the, you know, if you look at the the arm itself, the way it connects to the hand, the the arm that connects or the lower arm that connects to the hand is a little bit more, um, let's say, squarish, but still it's a rounder form. And then especially the the muscle indication that you have here for the hand between the index finger and the thumb, like it's very round, right? But you're indicating a very rigid line for that shadow shape. So we don't have any um, intermediary like values that can indicate the, the rolling of that form and make it more volumetric. And that's why we introduce half tones. So this one could definitely, if we look at the value change, it's it's even like if we go from the shadow to half tone, oh, from half tone to shadow, it's very abrupt, right? So we could definitely do with a little bit more of a saturated half tone here to better indicate that rolling of form. And this is also where, um, you know, being an inker or learning from inkers is going to come in handy because you can, uh, what inkers tend to do, what line decker also tended to do is follow the contour line of that form to even re-emphasize that, that rolling of that form, right? And that creates more volume in your work. And then like, like what Matt, Matt said about, you know, the, the, the cylinder that we have, a simple cylinder, or even like this is also like a manipulated sphere. We have the highlight usually existing on the plane that is facing the light, right? If you look at this as being planes, and then the other ones are planes that are still facing the light, but not as much or not as direct 
as the light source. So that's also going to be the case for this one on the other side. So instead of it being a highlight like you indicated, it should be more of like a, a lighter half tone to better indicate that volume. Right, and then we can even, um, because we have an abrupt change, if you look at um, an artist like uh, Paul Bonner, right? If we have an abrupt change from like a volume, like something that's round, and then we instantly change to something that protrudes out more, what Paul Bonner tends to do is re-emphasize that again, again, stating the obvious a little bit more, by in that crease line, creating a little bit of a highlight. Now, I, I talk about this in the material characteristic video, why that is, is because, um, you know, things that are abrupt, like corners like this, or like this, or in this case, right, something that is abrupt like this, um, a corner is gonna have less surface detail or less texture than anything else. So it's gonna be able to reflect the intensity of the light source more. Um, and that's why you'll tend to have a little bit more of a highlight in things like the corners of your room or creases like this. Um, and so that's something that you can indicate as well, right? And so I think, I feel like most of this applies to all of the hands that you've been doing. Uh, and that's something that you should definitely take into consideration.